Hello, everyone. Welcome back to our English conversation program. How are you doing today? We hope you're doing fine. This is Katsu Akitogo inviting you to join me again for the guest hour together with... Seth Higgins. Hello, everybody. The guest for this month is Dr. William Malm, professor of music at the University of Michigan. He's now in Japan at the invitation of the Japan Foundation. Let's see what he has to say. Welcome back to our program, Professor Mom. Thank you for inviting me again, Beth. Hello, everyone. Um, I'd like to begin by quickly summing up what we talked about last week for the benefit of those who missed that program. Professor Mom is here in Tokyo on a Japan Foundation Fellowship and is studying theater music, specifically music in the Kabuki and Bunraku theater. Well, Dr. Mom, my first question today is about Japanese traditional music. May I ask what makes it unique compared with other uh, with music in other countries? Well, the particular quality of Japanese music that uh, is most striking to me is it's uh, it is a linear music. It goes in lines, and it's transparent lines. You can hear each line. Hmm. In other words, if you listen to Western music, let's compare with Western music. There are other musics, but let's compare with Western music. In Western music, in traditional music, what you hear is a line on top and a line on the bottom. I call it polarity, you know, some negative and positive. You have a bass line and a melody line, and you thicken out the entire middle part with vertical sounds called chords. It's a very thick, very powerful structure. Japanese music runs the totally opposite direction. It's lines going parallel, and they have a different sound. For example, if you listen to a no drama, you don't hear everything melted together like a dance band. You hear the no drama drum separate from the singer, the singer separate from the flute. It's very separate sounds moving together in time. And it's absolutely uh, fascinating to me. I should point out to you, by the way, it's also fascinating to contemporary composers of Western music because they are looking for that kind of linear, transparent quality. If you think of Japanese uh, painting, particularly uh, ink painting, sunye, it's the same kind of linearity, the same kind of line. Mm. That's what's very special about Japanese music. And uh, I understand that you play uh, some Japanese musical instruments yourself. Uh, what aren't they, may I ask? Uh, I have taken lessons on the shamisen, mm -hmm. and then uh, on Japanese singing of Nagaruka, mm -hmm. also Japanese singing of Gidayu. Mm -hmm. Then I've also taken lessons on the hayashi, the instruments of the kabuki theater, that is the otatsumi, the kotatsumi, the taiko, the takeboe, the nokan. Wow, so many. But you know, just for us laymen, uh, shamisen has only three strings and uh, uh, other instruments. Uh, for instance, the piano has a lot more keys to uh, put your fingers on, and uh, so shamisen seems to be easy to play, but uh, do you have any comments on that? The piano is so much easier to play, it's totally mechanical. All you have to do is hit the button and it goes off. The shamisen is much closer to the violin. There is no there are no finger positions on the fingerboard. An auto-tune shamisen is just as auto-tune as an auto-tune violin. Mm -hmm. So the, the challenge of, of a shamisen is a, is a challenge of a Western violin. The piano is a totally mechanical instrument. Mm -hmm. You could play the piano if you could see the key. But a, a shamisen and a violin, you have to hear to play. Professor Toko just asked you about uh, some of the uh, difficult points of um, playing Japanese instruments, but I'd like to ask you personally, what are some of the problems you have when you play them? That's a difficult question. I, I suppose the hardest thing to see to remember is that it took me only, it only took me 20 years, by the way, but I finally figured out something which I should have known a long time ago, namely that the function of a musical lesson in a very traditional situation, let's say in a kotsu drum, is not musical. The function of the lesson is a way towards enlightenment. And you have to enter into it spiritually. Now, very honestly, that is true of Western art music as well. A really great violinist, a really great pianist, is totally into a sort of a, a special experience. But normally speaking, a music lesson doesn't feel it. 
I've had a singular good fortune in Japan for having teachers who were not just teaching me music. We often talk in Japanese lessons about the ki kyoko or the hitsu na koto, the secret thing. And we never talk about it really, but what it is, the problem is yours. But that's a very Buddhist concept. The problem of any enlightenment is yours. It doesn't come from the teacher. The teacher only shows you the path. So I find that that's probably the most challenging thing is to get yourself spiritually in a condition to play the instrument beautifully. I've had, by the way, in that context, I've had the same experience with Western students. I can never teach a Western student the taiko, the stick drum, the taiko stick drum. And he was very excited to learn it. He learned one pattern, another pattern, another pattern, and then came to a very famous pattern called kakira. But I couldn't teach it to him because he was not spiritually ready for me to teach it to him. And even I did it. She's ended, you understand? I didn't intellectualize it. It just happened. I realized he couldn't play that yet. Now, when I say he couldn't play that yet, I don't mean physically. Mm -hmm. I mean aesthetically, spiritually. Can I just ask you one uh, more question about the technical side of playing the uh, Japanese instruments? And uh, Do you have any difficulty uh, reading the musical notes? I'm sure the kind of notes uh, you use for the Japanese instruments are different from those for Western music. Yes, I think that you have to remember in any kind of music, you can use the old architect uh, model, form follows function. Mm -hmm. The kind of notation you use for an instrument in Japan relates to what the instrument is. Now, in Western music, we are very mechanical. We have one form of notation that works, is supposed to work for all teaching, called five-line notation. It's totally inappropriate for Japanese music. And uh, actually, no, I find it very helpful for what I want to learn to use the Japanese notation. Of course, the major problem is always the kanji. Mm -hmm. That's what you uh, uh, mentioned at the end of the last program uh, in relation to your experience in learning Japanese. Well, I understand you're concerned with uh, ethno musicology, it's quite mouthful for me, but can you tell us what it means and how it's related to, say, our everyday life? It is a very appropriate contemporary science. The ethno of ethnomusicology comes from ethnology, which means culture. Mm -hmm. The musicology comes from the science of music. And so when you're doing ethnomusicology, you are studying music in culture, or music as part of a culture. Some of my colleagues who are in the field are anthropologists, some are sociologists, and some, like me, are musicians. They study music and culture, and they don't try to make it just one particular culture that is politically or economically dominant in the world at a particular time. It may be that one culture, but it doesn't have to be. Therefore, some people study music in some part of Africa, or some people study music in various parts of Tokyo, or in various parts of New York City, or various parts of Tibet. Um, perhaps I'm mistaken, but it seems to me that the younger generation in most countries in the world today, including young people in Japan, um, just aren't as interested in traditional music as they are in, I don't know if this is the proper term or not, but shall I call it Western or European pop music or something. Anyway, do you have any comment on this trend, Dr. Mann? Yes, uh, it's a very uh, logical first assumption, but actually, you see, we now live under mass communication and jet age. We now live in what Buckminster Fuller called a global village. So we are all close to each other in sound, at least. Uh, and in that context, we also live in a computer world now. So everything looks like it's going to be the same. The most interesting thing to me is that the young people, in fact, I find, are very much involved, not just in the United States, but in Japan and in Europe, in what I would call roots movements. Roots movements. They're trying to find some way to make themselves unique in a computer, plastic, mass communication world. The net result is that uh, we have more and more Americans singing folk music again, playing banjo again, 
we have more and more Europeans taking up the bagpipes and all kinds of things in mean, France, taking the French uh, bagpipe. And, and here in Japan, you find more and more young people playing Matsuri Bayashi. Uh, Jangarabushi is, 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 is very, very popular in Tokyo. Urban folk music is very much there. And we, of course there's always popular music, and the international popular scene is very wide, but please notice that in each part of that world, the one you know here in Tokyo, or in Japan, there is a special form of Japanese rock, which isn't the same as British rock, isn't the same as American rock. So within that international idiom, each group, even there, is shaping something to make it a little bit its own. And that makes me wonder, uh, what are some of the roles then uh, music plays in our daily life, or what is the importance of music for human beings? Well, music has the ability to communicate uh, feelings and emotions in a way that language cannot. What do you say after you say, I love you? It's amazing how many times you turn on a record. Mm -hmm. I still recall I was in Tokyo when President Kennedy was assassinated. And of course, naturally, I listened immediately to the Far Eastern Network because that was the English language programs coming from America. I was dying to know whether he was live or dead and so on. And what does a radio station do, a military radio station do, when the president of a country just died? Do you read a poem? Do you tell his life story? Do you have the weather report? Do you tell a sports broadcast? For the first time in history, all they could do was play slow movements from symphonies because there was no way they could say it. So music has always played that function. Whatever you try to say, I'm happy, I'm sad, whatever, it helps. It's essential. Um. I think, uh, speaking of human communication this way, that many people often say uh, music is an international language. Um, in what way do you think music can serve that purpose most effectively? Well, that's a very common statement, and you're quite correct in saying it. But I hate to tell you, it's not true. Music is not an international language. It consists of a whole series of equally logical equally logical, but different systems. Uh, for example, in communication level, if I were to give this broadcast in some African language like Swahili, it, it doesn't communicate much to you, but it does communicate to somebody there. And each, the fascination, each part of the world, every part of the world has some kind of music. Every part of the world has some kind of a language they speak in. But the fascination is each one comes out differently. And the fascination to us is to begin in this new mass communication world where you can hear the music of any part of the world here in Tokyo. You can hear the music of India. You can hear the music of China. You can hear the music of the Near East. You can hear the music of America here. Or the, even that, that small part of the world's music called the European, European art music. You can hear that here. But then the fascination is that you, if you begin to listen to it with a more open ear, you begin to find out that there are so many things to hear in music, but they're all different, and many of them are beautiful. And the most beautiful one for us right now, of course, is the music of Japan. Well, Professor Mom, I'm afraid that's all the time we have today, and I'm sure our listeners really enjoyed uh, listening to you, and thank you very much once again for being with us today. Thank you. Everybody, this concludes today's program. So long. Goodbye, everyone. Goodbye, everyone.